I had a, a couple encounters with the Yakuza. You know, many of you know I was living in Japan for eight and a half years. Uh, the Yakuza is, is the Japanese mobsters, Japanese mafia, and uh, they're often identified by beautiful, ornate uh, tattoos. Uh, tough people, uh, very, very, uh, I don't know, self-righteous, like entitled, like, like uh, they feel other people should move out of their way for them, that they, that they, that they can run the show. In uh, one time, I and my friend who was a missionary else as well, Chris Kelly, uh, he and I were walking uh, near Himeji Castle, which is this unbelievably majestic castle. It used to be, the castle grounds used to stretch for several miles. This is how it was. Uh, but today it's reduced to, well, it's still gigantic, but uh, I guess there's 83 buildings still remaining intact. The main uh, building is several stories high. It's called the, the White Heron Castle because it sits on the plain from far away, just like a beautiful white bird almost like sitting on the plains. It's, it's a, a, a world heritage site, and it's one of my favorite places on the planet. And I would go there and just walk around. And one time, if you, if you come in the evening service, uh, Vance comes there. He came to Japan to visit me, and we were at the castle and found this massive snake. It was like six, seven foot long, and it followed it, and it went into a tree, and I pulled on its tail. And, but I didn't pull it out because I didn't want it to whip around. I thought, his head's in there. He can't get me. So I had fun pulling on the tail. But... This time, uh, my buddy Chris Kelly and I were at Himeji Castle, and we were sitting on a park bench, and uh, two rough-looking guys older than us uh, approached us. And uh, they look like trouble, but I'm trying to be friendly, so I'm smiling, and it turns out that they spoke only Japanese. They weren't speaking English, but they were offering us prostitutes. And so I said, no, thank you. We're Christians. And uh, trying to explain, and inside I was a couple things. I was looking for a way to run, although I thought I was faster than my friend and I didn't want to leave him behind. Uh, I was trying to remain nice on the outside, but inside I thought, I can take these guys. Not just me and my friend, I think I could take both these guys. And I was, because I'm young and stupid, and I'm thinking I can nail them. But you're thinking a lot of things, and I'm thinking, but these guys are part of a big, nasty group, and they might have weapons. So I don't want to go there. And I'm also thinking, because I'm a missionary, because I love Jesus, maybe God brought him here so I can share the gospel with him. And so they're trying to give us prostitutes, and I start to explain what Christianity is. And because uh, this may be a God-ordained meeting. And while they're trying to give us prostitutes, the other guy says, oh, well, wait, 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 wait a minute. Uh, the girls have the day off. And they say, oh, yeah, no girls today. And he leaned in close, and he put his hand on my thigh, which made me uncomfortable, and I thought, Two inches more, buddy, and I'm clocking you, you know? <laughs> but I'm smiling, and uh, I gently, I don't knock his hand away. I take his hand, put it away, and I said, uh, he said, uh, so do you like boys? Because <laughs> the girls are on vacation, you know? And I said, no. And he said, well, you're a Christian. You're supposed to love all people. <laughs> well, not like that. And uh, thought they would go away, but they're persistent. So I stood up. And I was bigger than that guy. So I made myself big, and I pulled his hat down. I said, we're out of here. And uh, my buddy and I left, and they followed us for a while. And I'm thinking, I hope they don't call more people. But why would they just accost us? They would made no sense. But you know, you're, afraid, you're fearful in that circumstance. Uh, another time, I was at a train station in Osaka, and it was crowded. And, and I hear uh, somebody say, Dan, Dan. And I look over, and there's a guy in short sleeves, shirts, tattooed, all tattooed. He was yelling my name. He came over, and uh, he was missing a finger, which is the price you pay when you want to leave the Yakuza. If you want to leave so that they don't hunt you down and kill you or make your life miserable, you have to ceremonially have a finger cut off so you're leaving something with them, and then you're allowed to leave. And uh, he had been a former Yakuza, and he was bringing his family over so they could meet me, his wife and, and a couple kids. Uh, this is a different group than that first group, but he was smiling. He was full of joy. He did not offer me female or male prostitutes. He had two mentally handicapped children. He thinks they were mentally challenged because of his drug use in his former life. I don't know if that's medically true or not. But he was just vivacious, friendly guy, nasty looking tattoos, finger cut off, and just the friendliest guy. What was the one difference? Anybody want to guess? 
Jesus Christ. Uh, the man in the train station was a Christian. And that's, of course, how we got to know each other. He was this former gang member, a nasty piece of work. And uh, he met the king of the universe, and everything changed. And now he was the friendliest guy you could know uh, with his wife and kids, a Christian family living for Jesus. Sometimes you hear the phrase, if you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Well, today we're going to look at Jesus Christ on trial. Jesus Christ on trial. Please turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 27, 11 through 26. Matthew 27, from verse 11. <clears throat> so Jesus has been arrested. Uh, Judas betrayed him. We saw Jesus, uh, Judas kill himself. Uh, Jesus was in this sham trial with the uh, Jewish high priests. And uh, at that time, they were trying to find charges against him. They could not find him with anything to charge with. Uh, and then Jesus said... Uh, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. And you know what's really bizarre? How often do you hear today people say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God, or we don't know, uh, maybe, the, maybe that was something that developed later in Christian history. The Jewish people who heard him speak at that moment said, this is blasphemy, he's making himself equal to God. So it's kind of funny that 2,000 years ago, we think we understand we were saying better than the people that were actually in the room with him and really clearly understood what was going on. And, but the Jewish people have a problem. If they killed Jesus, they'd be in trouble with the Roman government because Rome is ruling over the populace. So they hand him over to the local governor uh, for trial. So that starts uh, 27 verse 11. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, the governor's name is Pilate, and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus replied, as you have said. When he was accused, the chief priest and the elders, uh, by the chief priest and the elders, he gave no answer. And this is in answer to a, a fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 53 that said he would be led like a sheep. And so they're heaping all these false accusations on him. He's not even going to defend himself. It's, it's, not, it's pointless. And he came not to justify himself or to explain himself. He came to die for our sins. Then Pilate asked him, don't you hear the testimony that they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not, even a single, not to even a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. So he's wondering why Jesus isn't answering all these charges. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. So every year at the festival, what he'd want to do is he'd let one prisoner go free to make the crowd happy. Is kind of a gift to the, to the populace. Uh, at that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Bar Bar Barbas, uh, 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 Bar Barabbas, thank you. Uh, so when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you? Jesus Barabbas, uh, Barabbas? or Jesus, who was called the Messiah. For he knew it was out of envy that they had handed Jesus over to him. So out of envy because Jesus was popular. So of course he thought the crowd is going to say, let Jesus go, let Jesus go, which is what he wanted because he didn't think Jesus was guilty of anything worthy of death. And, and the other guy, Barabbas, was a, a nasty piece of work. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him a message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, Jesus, for I've suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. So she had a dream about Jesus uh, and said to her husband, better walk away from this one. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for a Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? Asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus who is called the Messiah? Pilate asked. They answered, crucify him. Why, what crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, 
which is pretty much the way it works when you talk to a, an enraged crowd, right? When he saw I was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar, a riot was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. He's saying, his blood's not on my hands. See what he's doing there? He, he thinks he's absolving himself from the situation, but all he's doing is uh, deceiving himself. I'm innocent of this man's blood. It's your responsibility. All the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. What a horrible thing to say. But they were so angry, so angry and filled up with rage. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. A few things jumped out. One is uh, you and I, brothers and sisters, we're Barabbas, aren't we? Barabbas was this person who was deserved punishment. He deserved execution. He deserved the crime that was, but he was set free because of Jesus. Jesus took his place. You and I, if we have put our faith in Jesus, we're free. We're totally free. There is no more judgment against us because Jesus took our place. And remember that fellow I was telling you about that I saw on the train station, Dan, Dan, and came over? Uh, he was a member of a group. He wasn't the only one. There was a whole bunch of former Yakuza. Uh, all, well, all these tattoos, all missing fingers that have become Christians, and many of them pastors. And uh, the name of their group is Barabbas, Baraba. They call themselves Baraba in Japanese, Barabbas, because we are the nasty criminals that deserve punishment, and Jesus took our place. Isn't that a beautiful testimony? Uh, it's kind of scary. They said, uh, you know, Japanese like to do an onsen, this public bath, and uh, usually almost always men and men, men and women on different sides, you know, so there's walls between. But uh, they would go to a public bath, and they said the place would clear out all the time. Because it looks like a whole game of Yakuza coming in, right? They got all these tattoos you can really see. <laughs> but uh, living for Jesus, they even went to the White House and met uh, President Clinton and shared the gospel with him. Isn't that a neat story? You didn't know that Japanese are going to America to share the, share the gospel, but uh, to share their testimony. Look at what Jesus, look at what Jesus can do. And nothing else on the planet does that except there's not a psychology, there's not a philosophy, there's nothing out there like that except what we encounter here through Jesus Christ. So, so either this is a divine miracle or you say, you got to say, this is some sort of weird psychological phenomena that's somehow a bunch of shepherds in the Old Testament, fishermen in the New Testament stumbled on this that changes people from the jungles of the Amazon to the Japanese Yakuza to, to, the, to the elite of, of uh, all over the world people uh, from the poor to the rich to the uneducated to, uh, to the geniuses have found peace and salvation and changed life through Jesus Christ. And there's nothing else like it. Uh, our God is good. And the doors of heaven are wide open for anybody. And that's why we need to get busy. We need to start. Uh, I'm, we already did. I, I take the start back. We need to continue sharing our faith with everybody we can. But I felt like George Bush when I did that. We need to continue, Kate. You know, <laughs> but sorry. Uh, I, I got to give up the comedian route, but anyways, we need to continue uh, sharing our faith with uh, everybody we can. Secondly, uh, I'm really not a fan of uh, riot mentality, and you even see it in the church sometimes. Brothers and sisters, when Christians protest something, whether it's abortion or whatnot, and we're carrying a sign or something, we, we cannot succumb to mob mentality. We have to love people on an individual basis. So as you're there, don't let your anger win the day. The Bible says the wrath of man will not accomplish the righteousness of God. And my brother uh, uh, Jason has shared many stories of how he was able to be in those circumstances and love people. I've been in a march before and was able to love people. Uh, we need to have a heart that wants to see people know Jesus and wants to show the love of Jesus uh, and not succumb to this angry angry, bitter mob mentality. Uh, per when people are in a mob, there's this sense of outrage that perpetuates, perpetuates itself, a perpetual outrage. And in this disability, this mental uh, mentality takes over where it becomes hard to reason. It's a brain cramp. And, and, it, and it doesn't have to be in a group. 
because we can learn this kind of perpetual victimhood, perpetual bitterness, uh, this sense of outrage, and where we practice it even in our one-on-one -on -re -one relationships or in small groups, and it becomes hard for us to be reasonable because we're always bent out of shape about something. Christian, are we known because of our love or because we're always bent out of shape about everything? Uh, and don't tell me, well, the world, well, yeah. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, why should you act like you have the Holy Spirit? Let's, let's pray. And my, my heart is nasty. I've got to pray in order to, to love people. And, and I think God has put heart and love in my heart for people. And many times people have been uh, insulting me, saying nasty things about me, and God just put me, I don't just love this person. They think I hate them, but I love them. And that's because of the power of Jesus Christ. But we've got to pray. We've got to keep praying. Otherwise, we'll just be angry, angry, bitter people. Uh, and people, it comes down when you're in a, this mob mentality. And again, it can be even on an individual. When you get this outrage in you, this I've been wronged, therefore I have a right to whatever. A person, when they feel ill-used, they feel that it's okay for them to do anything then, right? Have you noticed that before? And you get groups of people that I've been ill-used, so I have the right to do this. And you have people in relationships. I've been treated unfairly or badly, so I have the right to do this. You don't. If you've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, we gave up our right to retribution. We gave up our right to hold a grudge. We gave up all these rights. But when we have a brain cramp, we think it's a matter of justice. We think they must pay. <laughs> you know? Brothers and sisters, we are to be ambassadors of heaven. The hammer of heaven, God can hold that. God will bring the wrath. Let's be the ambassadors of heaven showing the love of Jesus Christ. In our hearts, we can say, crucify, crucify. And the really weird thing is, the one who loves you most, the one who made you, the one who made you for a relationship with you, Talking about God, right? The one who incarnated, set aside the glory of heaven, who is beaten on, spit on, insulted, rejected, ignored, because he wanted to suffer and take your place and take your guilt upon himself and, and take your punishment upon himself. This one, in our hearts, when we feel ill-used, we even shake our fist at heaven. Crucify, crucify, as if we'd hammer him to the cross again. Brothers and sisters, he loves us so much. He's done so much for us. How much does he love us? Remember? Like this much? He stretched out his hands. Uh, let's live our lives uh, in answer. Don't you want to live for Jesus because he died for you? Don't, don't you want to just share, share everything good about God wherever you go and talk about the cross? Don't be ashamed of the cross. Talk about the resurrected Jesus Christ. Jesus makes a difference in the world that nothing else can make. So, yeah, I understand dealing with the fallenness. I'm fallen. <laughs> We're all messed up. But we want to live for Jesus, don't we? Let's put God things first. God's ways are so much better than our messed up, nasty ways. Pilate uh, knew. He said, what did Jesus do wrong? Brothers and sisters, God hasn't done anything wrong in your life. He wants to love you, he wants to bless you, and he wants to be with you through this dark, fallen world of death and tears and bring you into eternity. Uh, J Pilate understood Jesus was wrong, but Pilate didn't get on his knees before the king. Big mistake. Fall on your face before the king of kings, confess your sins, say, have mercy on me, I, w I see you and I think I love you, and I want to follow you all the days of my life. Uh, Pilate reminds me of a guy who's trying to be intellectual. He's trying to be reasonable. He wants to be fair-minded. But in the end, he's not going to risk his skin for injustice done to people he can't understand. He couldn't understand Jesus. This is some religious thing. Well, he brought it on his own head. Well, he's really not a man of justice then, is he? He's, really ma he's not really not a good man. He's not a man of truth. Because he's going to let go of some people because there's some part of minority he doesn't understand, some religion he doesn't understand, some group he doesn't understand, some person. And, well, they bring this on themselves, so I don't care about justice anymore because otherwise it's going to come back on me. I remember Dad telling a story, and this, this kind of same kind of thing happened to me growing up, too, because we were, Yumi says I'm a justice man. 
and, and uh, dad was, saw this kid that was not popular in school. It was in the winter, and he's being picked on. People were throwing snowballs at him. So dad thought, well, I'm going to make this fun. He ran over right next to him and said, all right, buddy, let's get him. Dad's packing snowballs. They start throwing them back at the other guys. Crack! He gets one in the back of the head. He turns around, and the other guy saw an opportunity to make somebody else the target. Uh, that happens all the time. That happens all the time. Sometimes when you're going to do the right thing, you're going to catch flack for it. But if you're going to say, well, I'm not going to get involved. I'm not going to protect these people because their skin color is different. I'm not going to protect these people because their values are different than mine. They brought on their own heads. Then you are really not a person of justice, and you're really not a good person in your heart. Well, guess what? That's why we need the cross, right? But let's not excuse that in our hearts. Justice is for everybody, not just us, right? Let's have love and mercy for even people that are look different, talk different, uh, smell different, act different. Uh, Pilate wanted to be this good, reasonable man. He did not understand Jesus. And in the end, he says, I'm washing my hands of this. Sure, go ahead and beat him and kill him. That's very little admirable there, isn't there? Pilate is not some hero in history, is he? He failed. And he met the king of kings, and he failed to fall down and in, in obey and repent and in, uh, in fall in love with goodness. Love incarnate stood before Love incarnate stood before Pilate, and he missed it. He missed it. The next thing that really stands out is this shout from the masses. His blood be on us and as on our children. First, moms and dads, don't say that. <laughs> uh, don't do that. If you look at history, and I want to make this very clear, there's no way you can read the Bible and be, uh, hate, hate the Jewish people. There is no way you can be anti-Jewish. The, the, when the church has, has done this in the past, it's because they did not, either didn't understand their scriptures or didn't read them or more likely just didn't care. But there has been no other people group in human history that have been persecuted like the Jewish people. There have been no other people group that God prophesied in the Bible, I'm going to bring you into captivity, I'm going to disperse you to the nations, I'm going to bring you back, and that's happened multiple times. The last time, 1947. No other people group like this. Persecution, they said, their blood be on us and our children, and there's no people group that has had to endure this kind of suffering. But the Bible says that in the end, they will look on the one whom they have pierced, his Old Testament, and they will mourn as if mourning a firstborn child. And the Jewish people are going to become followers of Jesus Christ. It's going to be the greatest testimony uh, ever. And even today, even though it's still a small minority, more, people, more Jewish people are coming to faith in Jesus Christ since the first century. Isn't that beautiful? We're seeing so many things coming uh, to fulfillment at this time. But they faced hardship and persecution. And today, today, in all the capitals of Europe and even in the United States, there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people painting swastikas on, on, on synagogues, uh, carrying flags saying that the, the Jews are Nazis. Uh, incredible hatred. What other people group has endured this kind of hatred? Guess what? They've got like six million people in their whole country, less than the Chicago metropolitan area. And yet oh, a billion Muslims are infuriated at them. And Europe has a, a bloody history of, of abuse against the Jewish people. What, why this vile hatred? Well, because the devil hates the Jewish people because God loves the Jewish people. And if you love Jesus, you're going to love the Jewish people. And the Bible in the Old Testament says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Now, supporting the Jewish people does not mean you excuse everything vile that the nation of Israel does. This is complicated. I don't want to get off track. Two truths, okay? One truth is we call, in, we call wrong wrong no matter who does it. There's no such thing as these are our guys so we excuse their wickedness. If something is wicked, we call it wicked no matter who does it. When, when, the, when the, the nation of Israel does things that are against the will of God, like they forbid evangelism in Israel, it's not often enforced, but it's technically illegal. Uh, that's wrong. We, uh, abuse of prisoners, it's wrong. Uh, however, there is no moral equivalency. Israel uh, is the only democracy in the region. Uh, 
Palestinians living in the nation of Israel have it much better uh, than uh, places outside. How come, and I'm going to get off track just a second, because this is topical, this is timely. Do you see that the United Nations has issued more rulings against Israel than any other nation in the world? No communist nation, no Muslim nation, no other nation has been condemned as much as Israel, which is a democracy where there's freedom of religion. How come there's hundreds of thousands of people marching through the streets all over the world condemning Israel? In the last 20 years, a few thousand, to, I mean it's horrible, we don't talk about deaths casually, a few thousand Muslims have been killed by Jewish armies. In the same period, well over a million Muslims have been killed by inter-Muslim conflict. Well over. Why aren't people marching in the streets saying, Stop killing each other By, because it's a factor, an incredibly factor. It's a minuscule, the two numbers side by side. Why? Why does every nation get a pass? Well, because the devil hates Israel. And there's a nastiness that has come into the church where Christians are guilty of hating Israel, uh, hating the Jewish people. And uh, it's wrong. And Jesus Christ, Paul himself said, I wish I could give up my salvation for my countrymen, fellow Jews. Guys, we don't let racism in the church, do we? Don't talk about those people, whether it's black or white, whether they're Muslims, whether they're Jews, whether whatever. We don't, we don't let racism in. We don't let uh, people be, be uh, treated horribly because they're different than us. Uh, and don't join a mob mentality against Israel because it's a way to fit in and be popular. It's not acceptable. So these moms and dads are not so different than ourselves who are saying, his blood be on us and our children. Moms and dads, see, I'm back to the sermon now. <laughs> that was totally unscripted. Moms and dads, how you choose to interact with Jesus is going to echo on your children and on their children and on their children. Uh, uh, this idea, our blood be on, on our, and our children, say, wow, what's up with them? And yet, where is Jesus in our priorities? Do our children see us in love with God? What are we going to choose? Are we going to follow Jesus? Are we going to be excited to be at church on Sundays? Are we happy to, to give our 10% to the Lord's work? Or do we go and complain about those other people at church? Oh, I can't stand the way they treat me. I can't stand the way they talk. I can't or, or even the way they sing or, or whatever, the way they dress or whatever, their funny haircuts or whatever. Uh, are we going to reject Jesus? That echoes on the people around you. Many of you know the story how my great-grandpa, my great-grandpa, I got to know him and grow up with him. Uh, he was a wonderful old guy. My mom's half Chinese. My wife's Japanese. Do you know my great-grandpa was in the KKK? And he was selling uh, alcohol when it was illegal because of prohibition in the United States. And he was a fighter. He, was, he swore all the time. He fought all the time, known as a tough guy. A traveling preacher came to town. The Wolf family met Jesus. Now, I think I'm like a third or fourth generation great-grandpa, grandpa, my dad, my uncle, me. Yep, four. Generation. Uh, pastor. Things echo. What are you gonna, how are you going to echo on your kids? Are we going to reject Jesus? Or, or say that we believe in him, but I don't have time for him. That going to church, not a priority. Sharing my faith, uh, that'd be too embarrassing. Uh, we don't live like it. How about our language? Do we look like Christians to our kids? How about the way we act? What do, what do we value? Our choices. What do we make a priority? What do we love? Do we love the things of God? Do we love lost people? Or we talk about those people. What are we willing to sacrifice to build? The kingdom of God? The glory of God? Or our own personal little things? What can't we stand well, you know I can't stand racism, right? I can't stand uh, people using religion uh, to, to, to beat up other people, using religion as a way to elevate themselves. What can't we stand? 
you know, Jesus, we think he's meek and mild. Jesus hates sin, hates what sin does to people. Lust and, and greed and all these things ruin us. Because the things we love echo, and the things we hate echo. I'm really hoping my son grows up to love the Green Bay Packers. I, I, would, I would pray about it if I, well, I might. Uh, because if it's important to us, we want it to be important to our children. God's the same way. These things are important to me. This is important to me. This is why I gave you the book. Boy, I hope it's important to you. God wants these things to be important to us. This uh, short section that we studied today was about Christ's trial, Christ on trial, but it's not something that just happened a long time ago because the way we interact with Jesus in a very real sense in our culture, Jesus is still on trial. People, who are you, Jesus? Well, you're going to see me. I'm coming in the clouds of heaven. He's the son of God. Who are you? The, 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 the priest didn't get it. Pilate didn't get it. In your life, who is Jesus? And when the world sees you, sees your family, Jesus is still on trial. The evidence of who he is is revealed in our lives. In our church, who is Jesus? Is Jesus Lord or is tradition? Like we have a church culture, we've always done this, we're always going to do this. Or I've got my little personal kingdom and this is what I'm going to do. Or is Jesus the Lord? Why are we here? Are we here to have a holy huddle where we pat each other on the back and feel good about each other? Are we here to do what it takes to win another soul one by one, one more person into heaven, one more person into heaven? Because if Jesus died for that purpose, we want to live to make people right with Jesus, to make people right with God. In our families, Jesus is on trial. In our own lives, Jesus is on trial. And I want to I want to make sure that I honor him as my king, as my Lord. And I want other people who in their minds, Jesus is on trial, I want them to see and think, well, maybe there is something to this. I've got to find out. Because if God is real, I can't miss this. The question that needs to be determined for each one of us, who is Jesus? What does Jesus mean to you? How are you going to respond to Jesus? How is your life going to be, look different? Because Jesus is real and Jesus is king. Any questions? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, here we are uh, together. Uh, for those who haven't made up their mind yet, Lord, I'd just like to pray so we can all pray together. Father, we confess our sins. We see you and we know you're good. We see ourselves. We know we're not. Lord, thank you for the cross. Thank you for dying for our sins. We want to take that love. We want to take that forgiveness. We want to accept your grace. There's no reason to keep it far apart. And Lord, we give you our hearts. We give you our lives. We give you our minds. We give you our, our language. We give you every part of us, Lord, and we want people to see Jesus when they see us. We want to live lives. We don't want to just suck air. We don't just want to eat food and defecate. Lord, we want to live for you. We want to live for your love. We want to live for purpose and meaning, and we want to live for the kingdom, Lord. Please use our lives to win more souls to heaven. There's no other greater purpose. So Lord, take us. Here we are. Please use us. We thank you for your love. Help us to love other people. Help us to be good forgivers. Help us to grow in maturity, Lord, and slow at taking offense. Help us not to take a mob mentality, Lord, but to take your mentality everywhere we go. And Father, please use our church to make a difference in our community. Please, please use us, Lord. Pray this in your name, Father, and please remind us of these things during the week. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.